This is the story of a secret British Army unit set up to deal with enemies of the state on the streets of the United Kingdom. So what was the mission, as you understood it? To draw out the IRA and to minimize their activities. Minimize their activities? Yeah. In what way? Well, if they needed shooting, they'd be shot. Now, after 40 years of silence, members of this undercover unit speak candidly about what they did for Queen and country. We were not there to act like an army unit. We were there to act like a terror group. This is a, a 9mm SMG, a Sterling. But this is a little bit beyond the normal SMG because it's fitted with a silencer. We picked up shells which went right down the street there for about another 20 yards. And it's a Sterling automatic. We've investigated the unit and discovered evidence that this branch of the British state sometimes behaved like the IRA and shot unarmed civilians. He told me that he thought he was going to die. And I told him, no. Tonight, we track down one soldier accused of firing on innocent citizens. Hi, Hello. Hi. Mr. Williams. Yes. John Ware is my name. Forty years on, the victims and their relatives still want answers. Oh, yes. We want the truth. We don't want to stop if we have to the truth. People like us had to make decisions under horrendous pressure and make the right decision. That's why I'm here today and they're not. In January 1972, British paratroopers shot 26 unarmed civilians during a protest in London Derry. 14 people died in what became known as Bloody Sunday. What happened next is obscure. The army say their men were fired on by... Getting to the truth took nearly 40 years and an inquiry costing nearly 200 million pounds. Some of those soldiers are now being investigated for murder and attempted murder. What happened on Bloody Sunday was both unjustified and unjustifiable. Today, case files of the conflict's 3,260 dead are being reviewed as part of the peace process. Our investigation has discovered another group of soldiers who now stand accused of shooting unarmed civilians in 1972. These soldiers were undercover, and what they did has been airbrushed from the official record. But some have now emerged from the shadows. I was told it was a plainclothes, small unit operating mainly in Belfast, and it was called the MRF. It stands for? Well, it actually stands for Military Re uh, Reaction Force. Seven former members of the MRF have spoken to us about what the unit did. Three agreed to go in front of the cameras, on condition that we disguise their identities. I travelled from Liverpool Ended up in Belfast on a very dark night, waiting on the harbour there, waiting for them to pick me up, unarmed, and eventually ended up in Hollywood. Palace Barracks. Palace Barracks. Inside the Palace Barracks was a, a big compound, a big corrugated iron compound. And to look at it, it just looked like a builder's storage yard. Mm. Anyway, we pulled up at the main gate of this compound, and the gates just opened. We couldn't take anything, not even photographs. No ID card, no tags, no letters with addresses on nothing. Anything tying us with military were totally out. We never wore uniform. Very few people knew what rank anybody was anyway. I knew the boss was a captain. These are the only known photographs of the MRF compound tucked away inside a British Army base. 
where ordinary soldiers were forbidden entry. This top secret unit had around 40 men, hand-picked from across the British Army. These were selected men who had experience, who were uh, well trained, knew their weapons, reliability and all the rest of those things which make a good soldier and put into teams and sent across. We were also told that we officially don't exist on paper. The unit doesn't exist on paper. And if you're caught, you'll be killed. And if you are caught and killed, the government would probably put out a story that you were just a, a soldier in plain clothes that was caught and by accident. The unit carried out round-the-clock patrols of West Belfast, heartland of the IRA, in unmarked cars. The cover didn't always work. When I had my first operation, there were three of us and this really clapped out Avenger. And I was the backseat rider. We saw a car that was on the wanted list. And all of a sudden we turned round and then they were up our behinds. At that time we were carrying the old... Um, the old personal weapon was a Browning. Nine millimeter. And all of a sudden, they open up with armor lights. All of the excitement going to the interviews and all this, and um, all of a sudden, I'm now in the firing line, in the seat of this bloody car that was absolutely clapped out, petrified. You know, this is the end before I even start. But the car was riddled with bullets, and not one of us were hit. MRF soldiers say they sometimes acted as bait, goading the IRA to come out and fight. The soldiers wanted to take the war to the enemy. This is a, a 9mm SMG, a Sterling. But this is a little bit beyond the normal SMG because it's fitted with a silencer. But why the silencer? Well, it's, uh, you know, it's quiet. And uh, we were on special operation, so, you know, we had to be silent. Um, to kill silently. Yes. Simple as that. The military reaction force was operating in what in 1972 was one of the world's most dangerous places. Within the space of 16 minutes alone, 13 blasts sent people screaming from one place of safety to another none of them knowing where the next explosion might come from. That year, there were over 10,000 shootings. Nearly 500 died, 5,000 injured. There was evil in the air just about everywhere. Uh, the shooting of soldiers and police were not an everyday occurrence, but certainly a weekly occurrence. Uh, looking back now, the times are absolutely chaotic and horrendous. The IRA planted nearly 1,800 bombs, an average of five a day. Take away the religious aspect, and some of these enemies were just people who had got hold of weapons and they wanted to shoot somebody. They were just pure gangsters because somebody had given them a gun. The soldier was shot on open ground after an earlier attack on an army post nearby. He was the Belfast was on the edge of anarchy. The politicians turned to the army to restore order. To the MRF went the task of infiltrating IRA strongholds to see while not being seen. British soldiers trying to pass themselves off as locals. So you needed a variety of different um, guises? Yeah. There was the trolley to pull when he's road sweeping. Belfast City Council dustbins. They'd use those on corporate operations. For what purpose? Well, just to stand around in the street. What poses as a dustbin? Yeah. Through and you could reserve. observe the house or some people. I spent quite a long time in Belfast as a 
Um, a mess drinker. <laughs> um, just lying in the gutters in the streets. You'd have a machine gun in the, in the bin. You wouldn't have rubbish in the bin. You'd have a machine gun in the bin. I had magazines, spare magazines, strapped onto my other leg. And then I carried a, a PPK on the back of my belt here, which smaller pistol, and a Browning under my left, and my Pi radio to my right hand side. We were, we were quite, quite armed. And you never attracted any suspicion? No. Nope. That takes a lot of courage, and it's a cold courage. It's not the courage of hot blood, which soldiers in a firefight in conventional terms will, will find the adrenaline runs and, and gives them that extra. Jackson had served in Belfast as a young paratrooper and eventually became head of the British Army. He says he was barely aware of the MRF's activities, but he does admire the courage they would have needed. And you know, if you are discovered, a pretty gruesome fate may well await you. Torture followed by murder. However, surveillance was just one part of the MRF's mission, according to the soldiers we spoke to. We had two basic arms. One was a surveillance information intelligence gathering organization, and the other side was a hard-hitting counter-terrorist unit. Well, tell me about the hard-hitting side. <laughs> the hard-hitting side, we went out and shot the terrorists. Like their uniform comrades, MRF soldiers were given stop-on-site mugshots of wanted IRA members. They say they would sometimes do more than just stop them. If you had a player who was a well-known shooter who carried out quite a lot of assassinations, um, then he had to be taken out. Meaning? Taken out. Killed? Yes. Um, these would be... These are people who were known players, who were known shooters. Shot on sight, if you saw them. Well, yeah, because uh, they were known shooters, you know, within an organization. We were hunting down hardcore baby killers, terrorists, people that would kill you without even thinking about it. Killers themselves, and you know, they had no mercy for anybody. They kill each other for opening the mouth. With over 10,000 shootings in 1972, it's simply not possible to say how many the MRF were involved in. The killings have all the hallmarks of sectarian murders. The men who died were both Catholics and had just left the pub where one of them was a barman. MRF operational records have been destroyed and the soldiers we've interviewed have avoided incriminating themselves or their comrades. What is clear, though, is that in 1972, some plain-clothed soldiers did think it acceptable to shoot unarmed people. In April that year, brothers John and Jerry Conway were on their way to a fruit stall they ran in Belfast city centre. As usual, I would deliver the newspapers, which I did every day. Then the, the two Conway brothers, Jerry and that, the fruit man, that's how I know Jerry did well, he's a wee fruit man. He just waved over and that was the next thing. These two cars appeared out of, just out of nowhere, just disappeared. A car pulled up alongside. And your mom's on in the back one day. Yeah. I shouldn't do that at home. Uh huh. I said, Jar Jar, God rest him. We run. He run towards Falls Road. I turned and ran back towards Bala Murphy. Next thing, these people just jumped out and shot them. I run the zigzag. Bullet loads there, me. Jerry had been running down the white truck, and our car was there, so he had come over to the car and jumped 
speak up of it. Squealing, please don't cheat me, F wife and four B children. I think at that stage he didn't realise he was shot, you know. It's the first time I've seen blood so thick. You know, you cut yourself, you get blood. I've never seen... Sorry. Who did you think had shot you? I don't know who it was. Plain clothes soldiers had shot a couple of unarmed men, mistaking them for two of the IRA's most deadly snipers. Witnesses heard the soldiers say they'd got Tommy Toddler Tolan and Jim Bryson. Tolan got away. They say, that's not Bryce, that's not Bryson. That's Jerry. He's a fruit. That's we Jerry the fruit one. By the time uniformed soldiers arrived, John Conway had vanished. His brother Jerry was badly wounded and taken to hospital by the army, where they still insisted he was IRA man Jim Bryson. When I got under the car door, I could hear my brother shouting. And this soldier, Captain Sisson, said to my brother, Tell me you're fucking Bryson. And the soldier would keep repeating, he was Bryson. When I think of my brother said he was Bryson, I would fucking shout him. And that's the, my point of view. Even today, the Ministry of Defence refused to say whether soldiers in this shooting were members of the MRF, and the MRF soldiers we've interviewed wouldn't comment on specific operations either. We were there in a position to go after the IRA and kill them when we found them. Whether they were armed or not, occasionally that happened, yeah. It was shootings like that of the two unarmed Conway brothers that sparked rumours of an undercover army unit engaged in assassinations. The government gave this unequivocal denial to Parliament. In no circumstances are soldiers employed to assassinate people or in any way which would involve deliberately going outside the law. The trails work under normal military discipline and in accordance with the yellow card. The yellow card set out the rules under which soldiers were allowed to open fire. Troops were ordered not to shoot unless their lives or the lives of others were in immediate danger. The orders are, if you can see a gunman, a man with a weapon, then you may shoot him. A man with a weapon. The use of force must be reasonable in the circumstances. What the yellow car set out to do was to give some codification to that word reasonable. It was a guide for soldiers to say, if you yes. want to stay within the law, yeah. follow this. Yes, precisely. There were strict rules as regards the yellow you card. Knew the rules of the oh, yeah, I knew the rules of the yellow card inside out. But, but they um, didn't apply to the MRA. No. I just want to be clear about where the red line was, as it were. I think it's a fuzzy red line. It would depend on the situation, how it developed, whereas the, the uniform people, uh, they would be rigidly bound by it, even to the, down to the fact they had to carry the card or face court martial, or at least get charged. But there was some discretion allowed in your case. Yes, there, the case. there would be, yes, there had to be. If I got a weapon, the rules but I wasn't aiming the weapon at you, I was a legitimate target, yes? If you had a weapon? Yeah, but I wasn't aiming at you. No, you're supposed to be arrested. I'm supposed to challenge you and arrest you. I know. But you but you didn't. No. No. You would do what? Shoot you. At the time, the army's leading expert on counter-terrorism was this man, Brigadier Frank Kitson. A textbook he wrote became the army's manual on counter-insurgency. In order to put an insurgency campaign down, one must use a mix of measures, not just military measures, and it is sometimes necessary to do unpleasant things which lose a um, certain amount of allegiance for a moment in order to produce your overall result. Kitson was also commander in Belfast when the MRF was established. He'd done much of his soldiering in the dying days of empire. 
fighting in the British colonies of Kenya and Malaya. Kitson departed Northern Ireland in April 1972. Some of those he left behind had been schooled in the aggressive tactics of small colonial wars, some of which were illegal under British law. We've seen uh, Malaya, the fighting of Malaya, um, Cyprus, and things didn't always go by the book. In 1972, Tony Letissier was a major in the Royal Military Police. He'd been posted to Belfast to deal with a backlog of legal complaints against the army. For the professional soldier, no, it was difficult to accept that this was the United Kingdom. It was a fighting situation um, for which you'd been trained sort of thing and you were going to use the same methods here. You know, there were elements in the army that had imported a colonial approach to Northern Ireland. Virtually the whole lot had imported this. It wasn't just elements. It was a strong theme within the, the armed forces. That was their experience that they were bringing to Northern Ireland, where it was not applicable. Well, I mean, you could just about do anything you wanted. Northern Ireland was firmly split along sectarian lines. Both Republican and Loyalist gunmen would drive into each other's areas and fire at unsuspecting civilians. These became known as drive-by shootings. Work began this morning on putting up permanent barricades to block side streets in part of Valley Macarrit, the strongly Protestant district alongside the shipyard. Both Protestants and Catholics set up barricades to protect their communities. Both had lost faith in the British state's ability to protect them. Youths and men, masked and uniformed, armed with modern weapons, patrol openly. They control completely entry and departure. The IRA would sometimes stage events like this for the cameras. In fact, barricades were often amateurish, with unarmed locals just doing their bit to protect their communities. But that's not how some MRF soldiers saw barricades. Barricades were illegal. And generally, a barricade in a really bad area, there was almost somebody always armed on that barricade. It may not see the weapon, but it's almost certain that somebody's going to be armed. We used to just plod along, just do a quick assess the situation, and then just move in and take a few targets out and move along and let the uniform sort the rest out. When you say take a few targets out, what do you, you mean individuals on the barricade? Yeah, and, and they were fully armed, displaying weapons. Another MRF soldier told us that whether or not they could see weapons on a barricade, they'd sometimes, as he put it, give them a blast. We've investigated two incidents where witnesses say this happened with devastating consequences. The first was just before midnight. Aidan McAloon and Eugene Devlin were in a taxi taking them home from a disco. I remember saying at the time, the car behind us, and, and somebody said, oh, it wasn't much heat paid. We didn't pay much attention to it. We were tired, we're on our way home. This is the first time these men have told their story. Taxi turned around, dropped us off. We walked up Sleep Gallion Dave. There was a barricade farther on up, which was sparsely manned, five or six people maybe. At that moment, an MRF patrol car came cruising by. I thought it was all over, I thought it was the end. They were meaning to kill or maim someone that night, and they, they were trying their damnedest to do that. 
Within hours of the shooting, the soldiers had made routine witness statements to the Royal Military Police, and we've unearthed those statements. They don't match what the civilians have told us. As we approached the junction, a car began to suddenly revert onto the Anderson's Road. And in the headlights of the reversing car, I saw a man at the junction. He was armed with a firearm, which was aimed towards us. Did you see a rifle at all? No rifle. No did you weapons. have a rifle? No, I did not. Do you remember seeing a man with a rifle? No, nope. definitely not. Did you have a rifle? Uh, no. I heard a shot fired, which could have been aimed either at us or the reversing car. I then aimed at the man with the rifle and fired a total of eight rounds from my SMG. Later that night, both victims say they were forensically tested by the police to see if they had handled firearms. The results were negative. They were out to do something that night because no one had weapons at that barricade. After opening fire, the MRF car returned to base. However, it was part of a two-car patrol, and the second one continued to circulate. Within minutes, five more men had been shot. A man came to my door and told me that a man had been shot. I recognized him as Pat McVeigh, one, one of the parishioners in my district. I knelt down beside him and gave him the last rites. Was he conscious? No, he was, he was dead. Patrick McVeigh's family say he'd been on his way home from the pub and had stopped to chat to some friends, dismantling a makeshift barricade. I arrived home late, and there was people standing in the hall, and I couldn't understand what was happening, and the door opened and there was a neighbour. And when I walked in, she just pulled me and said, your daddy's dead, he was shot. And obviously, you're in denial, shaking your head, no, no. And at that stage, my mummy had been sedated by the doctor, and uh, that's how I found out. What was your dad like? Um, a good person, um, very loyal, hard-working, and good to his children, um, just a nice person. I was horrified when I heard the man had been killed, and I couldn't believe it. And I was just thinking to myself how lucky I had been to be alive. Patrick McVeigh and several other people were at this corner of Riverdale Park. Fort Cortina swept up and the machine gunner inside spread the group with at least 20 bullets. And they were spread from around here. The, the bullets went through the back of this car. The IRA propaganda machine was quick to exploit the shooting. Jerry O'Hare was then the IRA's Belfast spokesman. Were any of the men that you saw known to you to be involved in the IRA? No, absolutely not. There were people who at night time would have come out and manned the barricades in their own areas. and There had to be local people because they would have known who was coming in and coming out. You couldn't put people who didn't live in the area on it. We've learned the identity of the commander of the MRF car who opened fire with his machine gun on Patrick McVeigh. Sergeant Clive Williams of the Royal Military Police, known as Taff. This is a rare picture of Taff Williams. Taken when he was in the MRF, it's a grainy official photograph which shows him dressed in civvies. I would say he was fearless. Was he a compassionate man? With us, yeah. Not with the enemy. He had a good feeling for it, did Taff Williams. Four hours after the shooting, Sergeant Williams gave his version of events in a statement to a fellow sergeant in the Royal Military Police. One of the men in the group of four raised his weapon and fired three rounds at our vehicle. The wounded men and their clothes were swabbed to see if there was any evidence they had fired weapons. The forensic lab could find none. 
Tests in 1972 were not as reliable as they are today. However, police at the time were satisfied that none of the men had been armed. The army tried to cover up their involvement in this shooting. They called it a crime which was motiveless, implying it was sectarian. The assumption was that it was a, a group of loyalists that had done the shooting. And that was a dangerous assumption because that increased the tension between the two communities. It was six weeks before Patricia McVeigh learned that her father had been killed by undercover soldiers and then only by chance from a detective. How did we react? Astonished, astounded, angry. That, you know, the forces that were supposed to be protecting us had actually killed my father and injured four other men. It didn't seem right. When I went home that night to go to bed and I took off my trousers, my knees were covered in his blood. I, I, I felt it dreadful washing the blood of that man from my knees. None of the MRF soldiers we've spoken to were involved that night. But one did explain why those on a barricade should not have been given the benefit of the doubt. We were finding our targets and we were shooting at them. We, shot, we, we found our targets and we eliminated them or neutralized them, whatever you want to call it. We didn't go around town blasting, shooting all over the place like you see on the TV. We, we were going down there and, and finding, looking for our targets and finding them and then taking them down. We may not have seen a weapon, but there more than likely would have been weapons there in a vigilante patrol. So sometimes... It's possible they could have been shot at even if the weapon hadn't been seen. But he's saying to me that on occasions the MRF would make an assumption that someone had a weapon even if you couldn't see one. Occasionally. And they would get shot. Occasionally. Some people would say that's murder. Um, yeah. In fact, I think most people would say that's murder. Possible. I wouldn't say that. But if you haven't seen a weapon, you don't have evidence that they've got a weapon, then you shoot. There's an assumption. You can't kill people on that basis, can you? Um, well, you're not supposed to, but no. we were in a a terrorist conflict mm -hmm. and people in that area it all depends on where they are and what they're doing at the time and as far as we were concerned as far as i was concerned and a few other people in the unit concerned people caught in a specific situation a specific area were part and parcel of a terrorist organization Six weeks later, Sergeant Taff Williams was once again on patrol, one that would eventually land him in court. This is what local witnesses say happened, that once again, innocent and unarmed civilians were shot. A lovely sunny day, around about lunchtime. Um, just sitting on the ground, no terminus. Door open, feet sitting on the ground. This Cartina drew up. Guy sitting in the back, put his top, put a submachine gun out the window. I know nabs at the submachine gun, not at the time. And just opened fire. Bullock came through the door, put me in the chest. And that's sort of happened on a sunny afternoon. I didn't really hear any shooting. I sort of smelled it. And then it got this lightness and as if I was shot in the head, I thought I was getting I thought I was shot in the head at all. And then I was just collapsed, that was me. Mrs. Eileen Shaw saw the whole incident from her kitchen window. A car came down the Glen Road very, very slowly on the wrong side of the road. The back man produced a gun of some sort. 
fired indiscriminately at these men. Sergeant Williams had fired several bursts from a machine gun, hitting four men. You got a bullet in the chest? Yeah. Just one? Or? Just one, it's enough. Oh. Has it caused you much Unbelievable. difficulty yeah. since? Yeah. What Don't do there. Yeah. That's a uh, pain in the spine and eggs. Had to go to the hospital to get, uh, get pain injections. Had to go on painkillers. Every day? Every day. Even today? Today. 40 years on? 40 years on. Once again, Taff Williams said he only fired on the men because they had opened up on him. He said a bullet had smashed his rear windscreen. When we got to the hospital, over swabbed by the police for forensics, there's no traces of nothing. None of you were involved no, in the army? not one, no. At first, the army, once again, covered up their involvement. Later that day, they said plainclothes soldiers had been shot at and returned fire. Detectives from the Royal Ulster Constabulary were suspicious. I do remember the shooting on the Grand Road. Uh, I do remember uh, rumours going around that there was some funny army outfit was roaming about uh, West Belfast and other parts doing uh, strange shootings. We soon found out that they were called the MRF. When detectives inspected Sergeant Williams's car, they suspected he'd smashed the rear window to make it look as if he'd come under fire. Williams was eventually sent for trial at this now derelict Belfast courthouse charged on three counts of attempted murder. However, we can reveal that the jury got only a partial picture. I was given the job of covering the Williams trial. Hello, Hazel. Martin here. You give me a new desk, please. You know, supporters, we, we've never seen any undercover people um, being hauled into court and charged and being prosecuted. I mean, it just it, it didn't happen. Within the Ministry of Defence, alarm bells rang at the prospect of this secret unit being unmasked. Declassified files show just how determined the MOD were to protect the MRF. There can be no useful purpose in admitting the existence of any such organisation. There seems to be considerable advantage in maintaining as much confusion as possible. Sergeant Williams' victims sat in the public gallery to see and hear his testimony. The double of Omar Sharif. See, maybe it's just being so swarthy. Williams was put in my charge to take to court. Uh, I had to hand him over to the police uh, there at the actual trial itself. Williams' evidence was that he was responding to fire that had hit his moving vehicle. He was asked how he could possibly have returned fire at gunmen who were now behind his car and receding rapidly into the distance. So he, he used the end of a pew to demonstrate this. He sat there with the gun on the floor in front of him and picked up and whipped it round like this in the firing position. And it was done in a matter of a blitz second, you know. That wasn't the only bit of courtroom drama. There'd also been an extraordinary revelation. Williams had opened fire, not with a standard army issue weapon, but with a gun commonly used by the IRA, a Thompson submachine gun. We didn't know until then that this organization w was using the IRA weapons. Because really, if you're using a Thompson submachine gun, the and forensics come along later and uh, taking bullet holes out of cars, out of a wall, or even out of a body, they're going to say, well, that man was shot with Thompson submachine gun had to be an IRA killing. When challenged over the Tommy gun, Williams gave an explanation for why he had the weapon that he'd never mentioned in any of his police interviews. He told the jury he'd been on a firing range that morning, demonstrating the characteristics of the IRA's favourite weapon. 
Williams claimed that he happened to have a Thompson submachine gun under the back seat. It's just comical. It's ludicrous. It's like something out of a dime novel. I mean, really, you know, you, you just don't have to happen to have a Thompson, you know, uh, under the back seat of the car unless you're going to use it for some purpose. Uh, and not a very nice purpose. One piece of evidence the jury never heard was that the police suspected a cover-up over the Thompson because Williams had lied to them. At first, he told detectives he'd fired a standard army-issue gun. When confronted with evidence of Thompson bullet casings, he changed his story. Williams also told the police this was the first and only time he'd used the gun. But was that true? We found an officer from another regiment who told the military police in 1972 that he knew Williams sometimes went on patrol with a Thompson. Other former MRF soldiers independently told us the same story. Is it fair to say that it was Williams' weapon of choice? Yeah. Because? Because he liked it. Because? It was powerful. It had knockdown power. And it was a weapon that was associated to the terror groups. It was part of the disguise, which was perfect. If I'd have had access, if I'd have had the permission, I'd have probably used it as well. Well, they were playing at being bandits, weren't they? They were meant to be sort of IRA outlaws. That's what they were sort of pretending to be, I presume. That's why they were in plain clothes and they were operating in, in uh, plain vehicles and they had Tom Thompson's own machine gun. To what end, though? What, what was the military objective? I don't know. No idea. No idea. After a brief trial where several key witnesses weren't called to give evidence in person, the jury had to decide if they believed Williams in the face of witnesses whose accounts contradicted his. The evidence would be produced, proven that there was no guns on the scene, there were no bullet cases that the windscreen was knocked out from the inside. They had a Thompson submachine gun with no butt on it. Couldn't control the machine gun. And the evidence against them, they got cleared. How did you feel about it? Well, second. Williams was acquitted of attempted murder by a majority verdict. He was subsequently promoted, leaving the army with the rank of captain and the military medal for bravery. Today, Williams lives on the other side of the world. So we went to find him to see if, 40 years on, he was prepared to answer questions about the people he'd shot with a Thompson submachine gun. Well, this is where we think Clive Williams lives. It's been quite difficult, actually, tracking him down. When we call the house we're about to visit, his wife answered and said there was no such person living there, but... We think he does live there. Anyway, we'll soon find out. Hi, Al. Hello. Hi, Mr. Williams. Yes. Sorry to bother you. John Ware is my name. I'm making a program for the BBC. Um, yeah, not in touch. Go away. Well, we've got some questions to put to you. Sorry. We've got some questions to put to you. And they are... Serious allegations about the number of people that you are alleged to have shot. A lot of people will say that your silence speaks for itself. One of the questions Williams wouldn't discuss was how he came to have a Thompson submachine gun in the first place. Something else the jury wasn't told was that the Tommy gun used by Williams wasn't even owned by the army. In fact, it belonged to this man. Hamish McGregor, a 29-year-old captain serving in Northern Ireland with two para. He'd previously seen active service in Aden, winning the military cross for gallantry. We had many, many casualties coming in, and the soldiers, in fact, behaved magnificently. In May 1972, McGregor joined the MRF, and with him came his privately owned Thompson, which was kept in the MRF armory. He officially became the unit's commander 12 hours after Williams used the weapon to shoot four people. 
We wrote to McGregor, who retired as a brigadier, to ask, had he authorised Williams to take his Thompson on patrol? After a month, we heard nothing, so we paid him a visit. Mr. Ware, it's going to post something, to post you a letter. I see. So I didn't want to be interviewed, thank you. All right, I wrote it all in the letter. Fair enough. Thank McGregor's you. letter insisted that the only reason the MRF had a Thompson was for training. However, our evidence seems compelling that at least one of his men used it for more sinister purposes. By July 1972, the pressure was on for the MRF to get results. In Belfast this afternoon, as the streets were thronged with weekend shoppers, bombs exploded. One... The IRA had spectacularly breached the security cordon around Belfast city centre. In just 65 minutes, 19 bombs were exploded, killing nine and horribly maiming many others. Bloody Friday is one of the worst days I can ever remember. It was a war zone. On this, the heaviest day's bombing since the trouble began in Ulster. You know, that has never gone from the back of my head. And from that then, we were under a hell of a lot of pressure, I can assure you. We had to get results because people from above were streaming murder um, to prevent all this, you know, happening. Results meaning what, exactly? Well, you know, to, to curb the IRA presence coming into Belfast. Officially, the MRF didn't exist. However, by autumn 1972, rumours about a trigger-happy undercover army unit were rife. That September, another section of the MRF was involved in an incident which would make the unit a liability. It involved two young Catholic friends, Daniel Rooney and Brendan Brennan. The thing I remember is leaving the girlfriend's house. As I was turning into my own street, I seen Daniel and met up and we started to talk about different things. And we're just standing at the corner and we're just standing having a conversation, the three of us. As we were standing talking, we noticed a car coming down St. James's Road with the, the lights, full blast. They more or less glanced at us and we looked at them and just suspicious. Derek and I came down St. James's Road, we were on the Falls Road and we were just chatting. And it only seemed to be a matter of minutes when a fella came out of one of the houses across the street and shouted to us, get off the corner because there's strange cars in the district. It was just something about the car, the way it was driving, and we just automatically, both of us then, just turned and ran. The car went by, and we were, we were, we were talking about it. That's, that's when the shooting started. just turned and came through just a shot and I can remember thinking I'm going to be killed here. <sighs> he told me that he was shot and he thought he was going to die. And I told him, no, he'd be alright. A bullet had torn through an artery. Daniel Rooney was just 18. I was, I was exactly in my own house when I was told that he was dead. And do you remember how you reacted? Yeah, I cried my eyes out. What was he like? Cheeky, choppy, you know. Uh, girls all loved him, and very pleasant, come and go women. Yeah, very happy-go-lucky, yeah. just mm -hmm. out to have a good time and a good laugh, and you would have been a kidder, you know, mm -hmm. you would have 
had a job to do and that, you know. The next day, the army admitted plain-clothed soldiers had been involved. A hundred local women came out in protest. And I ran down and left at one of them young lads. Oh, God, the blood was just oozing out of them. One was shot in the back, right down the whole back. And the other one was shot right in the stomach. The Army's version of what happened is that a patrol of two cars with soldiers in civilian uniforms was coming up the street when five shots were fired at them. The Army claimed that Daniel Rooney was a known IRA gunman. There is no credible evidence for this. The IRA have never claimed him as a member, and on this Republican memorial just a few hundred yards from where he died, Daniel Rooney is commemorated as a civilian. See, there's a pattern here. This is the third shooting in a matter of months where the MRF have been involved. They say they've seen gunmen and weapons. The wounded and the dead are tested, swabbed. Uh, on each and every occasion, there's no positive okay. test of being near the weapons. I don't know How do you it. explain that? I don't. So what do you think the explanation? What do you think the explanation might be? Or is that? it possible that the police that tested them didn't really test them? A lot of strange things happened in Ireland at that time. The army didn't trust the police. The police didn't trust the army, and we didn't trust anybody. Nor in 1972 was there much trust in the ability of the army to investigate itself. Fatal army shootings were usually left to the Royal Military Police to investigate, whose inquiries sometimes amounted to little more than a cosy chat. We'd have a cup of coffee, we'd discuss what happened, and then we'd hand our reports over. Did the Royal Military Police basically use to rewrite your reports? Um, yeah, I think so. I think it's possible. They, they made some adjustments. I would imagine it was possible for people to concoct stories under those circumstances. I mean, a section that had been involved in an action, or half a section that had been involved in an action, you know, sort of, let's get this story together, boys, you know. That would be possible. I'm not saying it happened, but it would be possible. 3,260 people died in the 30-year conflict. Today, former detectives are reviewing all the deaths. They belong to the historical inquiries team set up to assist the peace process. For many families, the HET is their last chance to find out who killed their relatives and why. You're still asking questions 40 years on? Oh yes, we want the truth. We don't want to stop if we have to the truth. Some people would say, you can't turn the clock back, you've got to get on with your life. Well, we have, but it's still there. By late 1972, the army top brass were winding up the MRF. It appears that the Prime Minister, Edward Heath, had been informed why. At Heath's request, a top-secret note reminded the military that whatever undercover unit replaced the MRF, special care should be taken to operate within the law. There have been several occasions where you have acknowledged what the police would describe as criminal behaviour. Mm. Um, you'd accept that? They would probably describe it as criminal behaviour, yeah. How would you describe it? How would they describe it as fighting terrorists? In an unconventional way. And saving innocent people's lives. Which we did. We asked the MRF's officer commanding about the claims made by his men. Amish McGregor insisted to us that he ran a pretty tight ship and that the MRF was never tasked to hunt down IRA leaders and shoot them. That would have been against the law, he said. His unit had always abided by the yellow card rules. I am extremely disappointed that a very few have sensationalized a routine and often humdrum job and invented fictitious incidents 
to give the impression that the MRF was anything other than just another properly controlled and accountable unit. Whatever orders Captain McGregor gave, it seems they weren't enough to stop some of his soldiers opening fire on unarmed men. I'm not saying that anybody stood up and said, right, you have to do this. It was, just, it was, it was a prototype counter-terrorist unit, and we had to make up our procedures as we went along. And we did. Was it an understanding that you should open fire well, we, we, on these uh, top players, uh, whether they were armed or unarmed, or was it a specific order? We had to use our own initiative. That's why I was selected for this operation, uh, to use my own initiative. The MRF was answerable to 39 Brigade under the command of Brigadier Alexander Boswell. The MRF was wound down after an MOD review concluded there was no provision for detailed command and control. So we asked Sir Alexander Boswell, who retired from the army as a Lieutenant General, if that meant lethal MRF operations were not properly supervised. He declined to comment. Asked about the allegations that MRF soldiers shot on our men, the Ministry of Defence say they've referred this to the police to investigate. Your job was to hunt down the enemy? And to kill them, yes. Uh, and that's what was done. But were they specifically sent out to...? If you're talking about assassination squads, certainly not. We were not a death squad. We were there to do a job. To eliminate an enemy that was ruthless, dedicated to their cause. I totally reject the death squad. Uh, but, you know... Put yourself in my situation. Yeah, we're on our homeland. We've got a, a dirty war, a war that was out of control. We knew who the operators were. We knew who the shooters were. So what are you going to do about it, John? I'm asking you the question now. What are you going to do about it? Are you going to allow these people to carry on? Killing innocent people? Planting bombs? Killing ordinary civilians? People in this country were killed. So how do how would you defi define it? No, I think you've answered the question. Okay. The IRA surrendered its weapons largely because undercover soldiers and policemen crippled its ability to fight. The MRF was the prototype of this undercover war, and the soldiers who've appeared on camera have done so because they believe their contribution to this has never been recognized. Has there ever been a moment when, on reflection, you've thought, I can't sleep at night about that, or I wonder about that, or... Never. Have you felt that? Never. 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 The only thing I've ever thought about that unit and that job is that I did it the best job I could, and I couldn't have done it better. Yeah. And I'd go back tomorrow and do it all again. And you're proud of it. Absolutely. Right?